2018 along uh, the New York Times, along with the New Yorker for uh, in public service journalism for uh, work that exposed uh, powerful and wealthy sex. Is it? You don't need to do it. Am I doing something wrong? Sexual predators, um, including Hollywood producer Harvey Weinstein. Weinstein, of course, is in jail now, uh, due largely to this journalism. Uh, and it uh, the journalism also fueled a worldwide reckoning uh, with sexual abuse of women in the Me Too movement. So we'll talk about that. Is it me or is it like? It's not that bad. Just keep okay. Going. And uh, Kendall Hartness is a longtime photographer and photo editor who's now managing editor of diversity and community at the Minneapolis Star Tribune. She was part of the team awarded the Pulitzer uh, for in 2021 for breaking news reporting for its authoritative and nuanced coverage of the police killing of George Floyd and the impact that death had on the Black Lives Matter movement. So we'll explore a little bit about the impact of this. So thank you all for being here. Uh, to start, I just want to address, for especially for the people who are coming from outside the United States, we're always asked how Pulitzers are selected. So um, the publishers, media groups, individuals can nominate their work uh, for a Pulitzer in uh, 23 categories for annual awards for the best journalism of the year. Um, and that's in journalism and arts and letters. And um, so 23 total. Journalism includes local, national, international reporting, investigations, editorials, commentary. The arts prizes include uh, um, history, nonfiction, fiction, biography, a new category of autobiography and memoir, poetry, drama, and music. And we set up juries of five to seven members in each of those categories. And despite economic troubles in the media uh, and in publishing, we have a huge amount uh, of entries. So um, it's a formidable job. And uh, there's hundreds of fiction entries, for example. So the juries will narrow it down to three finalists, and then it goes to the board. And so, um, David, maybe you can talk a little bit about um, how the board narrows that down to the best <laughs> entry of the year to award the Pulitzer Prize. Well, it, it's a little bit like talking about the Vatican Council, right? And it, it's, it, but it's not as mysterious as a, the College of Cardinals. The the way it um, happens, I discovered, because I really didn't know much about it until getting involved on a first on a on a, a jury and then on on the bigger board, is that uh, various publishers, uh, news outlets uh, of all kinds, send uh, their material to the to the Pulitzer administrators who do an astonishing job of uh, sorting it out. Um, Hats off to Marjorie and Bud in the back and many others and John. And it's, a, it's an, an enormous job. And then each of these categories are, are come down to three selections. And it, then it goes to the larger board. And the, on the board are representatives of various out, outlets, AP, the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, the Atlantic, the New Yorker, whatever, whatever NPR. And we're faced as people who are have a very tight focus individually uh, with all this panoply of choices, whether it's novels or drama or spot, you know, uh, breaking news or feature writing, and they do their damnest. So in a way, you have specialists on the board um, who give extra guidance. I, I would say uh, a poet on the board probably has a stronger voice in the selection of the poetry winner than um, maybe anybody else as would you know as would be logical, but it is a very I, I I have to say and I've been on various panels and boards and group decision making, it's extremely rigorous. Um, people put in a hell of a lot of time and it's and it's very rewarding. Um, and we do the best we can 
and history will judge. Right. History will judge. I know that the selection of what the New York Times did on Me Too and what you all did on, on George Floyd, history will, is already judged. History is already judged. They, they were uh, just astonishing, astonishing work. Um, history will look back on, you know, Walter Durante winning in uh, for his work uh, in the Soviet Union has been pretty critical. But I think the best thing it can do the best thing it can do is elevate work. It, you know, the New York Times, with all due respect, the Washington Post, the New York, whatever. We have a big audience. We're really lucky. We even in this you know complicated time, we have resources to see a paper that doesn't have those that kind of scale or staff rewarded. I know not only does it make them feel good, which is which is great, but it also makes the country value places that need the attention and the um, uh, focus uh, and and understand the value of smaller papers. I grew up in New Jersey um, and every mayor of Newark went to jail, every single one of them. Hugh Adnizio, Ken Gibson, Sharp James, they all went to jail in, 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 until a Cory Booker came along. And I know that the newspaper there, the New York Star Ledger, which was um, you know, quite well to do at that time, had something to do with it all the time. My biggest worry in journalism now is who's going to send the corrupt mayor of a medium-sized city to jail or a judge or a council member. And so when a Pulitzer Prize can come along and say, look at that outlet, look at that newspaper, look at that radio station, look at whatever it is, or in the arts, look at that play that got middling reviews or a small audience and elevates it and gives it a second crack, or takes a book of poetry that sold 1,400 copies, mainly to libraries, and says, look at that, give that another look, that can do a hell of a lot of good. And so uh, to me, that's a worthy enterprise. So to that point, um, Joseph Pulitzer said, our republic and its press will rise and fall together. Is this selection pro process or the consideration uh, changing at all with media and democracy under siege? Uh, you know, my experience of the discussion is that the board is a hell of a lot more diverse than it ever was. Really, it's transformed. None of these processes is complete, whether it's in newsrooms or on Pulitzer juries, but I think that is extremely encouraging. And I think its choices reflect that. So I think that insofar as that's part of democracy, which I think it is, um, that's an encouraging development because for decades, like everything else in American society, uh, it was not reflective uh, of, of what we are, who we are in terms of demographics, in terms of a lot of other things. So I think that's that's a a point that gives me uh, some measure of optimism. This is not a complete process, um, either in my newsroom or yours or yours, by any stretch of the imagination, your job is to make sure it's better. And so is it mine, by the way. <laughs> um, but it, it's, uh, when I look at the Pulitzer board and I think of the Pulitzer board, what I know of it from 20 years ago, it's, you know, night and day. So one of the criteria which this is addressing is impact, and the board is always looking for journalism with impact. Um, Jody, you know, <laughs> the reporting you did had tremendous impact not only in sending Weinstein to jail and holding others to account, but in fueling the um, Me Too movement, and not only in the U.S., but internationally. Did you have any idea at the time you were doing that work that it would be so effective? So first of all, it's great to be here with you today. I'm honored to join the three of you. And as is the case with most panels with rooms of fellow journalists, I feel like I could be just as happy or maybe happier hearing what all of you are experiencing and have to say. Um, uh, but I will try to answer your question by saying this, Matt Purdy, one of our beloved editors would say constantly before the Weinstein story was published, but Harvey Weinstein isn't that famous. And he wasn't 
trying to detract from what we were doing. He was being a great editor and he was stress testing the material before publication. And the Times had just done the Bill O'Reilly story and Bill O'Reilly now there was a genuine famous person. It's funny, Megan and I speak to a lot of student audiences now and some of them don't like really remember who Bill O'Reilly was because it was so many sexual harassment scandals ago. Um, uh, but um, no, we had no idea. We were we were totally focused on the facts. And also, I think one thing that is always hard for people to understand is that we we weren't out to get Harvey Weinstein. We were out to get the truth. And sometimes I would even have to gently correct people. Like there were some, you know, powerful people in Hollywood who helped me and they would send me texts saying, you go get them. And, you know, you never want to do anything to push a source off or tell them that they're doing anything wrong, but you're also always paranoid paranoid as a journalist that your texts could be exposed through what well, turns out we were being surveilled and, you know, or through court. And so I would like gently, you know, give them these little journalism lectures and say, like, I just want to make it clear that like, there's no personal animus here. This is totally professional. Like we're like the evidence is mounting, but we're keeping an open mind. And this is, this is really honestly about just trying to figure out what happened. Um, but listen, during the course of reporting, a lot of people told us not only that we wouldn't get the story, but that if we did, it wouldn't have impact. As everybody knows in this room, a lot of reporting is listening to other people's condescending lectures. And I, I sat through a lot of lectures, uh, again, Hollywood executives that, that went something like, Jody. I know you don't know much about our industry, but here's what I have to tell you. Unfortunately, sexual harassment is just part of it. The casting couch has been part of Hollywood from the beginning. There's even a statue of it in the center of town, which was like actually true in Los Angeles for a long time. Um, and then they would say things like, and I'm a big feminist in the industry, but I, but I can tell you that, you know, what this business consists of is an assembly line of beautiful women from all over the world who come here for success and powerful men who see it as their right to take advantage of them. That has been true for the hundred years that Hollywood, as we know it, has existed. And like you, little lady, have no chance of anybody caring about your little story. But of course, that you proved them wrong. What changes do you feel that the, the that story and subsequent cases brought about? What was the impact in your mind besides sending him to jail? You know, everything changed and nothing changed. And I think you know we're about to hit the five year anniversary, and I think we're still we're still sorting it out. I, but I think, you know, um, my own reporting says that the camp that says, oh, you know, Me Too is dead, it's faded away. I think that is completely wrong. Of course, it didn't change everything. But the number of laws that have changed, the number of corporate policies that have changed, and I think the number of attitudes that have changed, like that that little lecture that I parodied a minute ago would not, I think, be possible in, in any respectable organization today. And I think the thing that changed most is the heart of what the kind of like original core Me Too journalism was about, which was sexual har harassment and abuse in the workplace. Like people think the Weinstein story is about sex. And of course, to some extent it is, but it's really about power. And if you look at, you know, one thing we really tried to make clear, even when we were writing the original story is this was not some guy in a bar hitting on younger women. This was the most powerful producer in the industry. And if you look at our stories and Ronan's stories, I think they match in this regard. Weinstein was constantly using the pretext of work to lure these women in. 
come upstairs. I have a script I want you to see. I want to go over the potential Oscar campaign for your movie. I want you to look at the dailies from my latest film. And I I really want your opinion. And these women, many of them in their first week on the job or very junior actresses, they had come in with what you know, I was reporting on my peers. I'm 47. And these were a lot of 40 something women. And we were the generation, we were the generation to come into the workplace and believe that we had a chance and believe that we get could get a piece of the action. And Weinstein took that hope and he turned it against these women. And so uh, and that is true of, of I think a lot of uh, the 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 sort of strongest Me Too journalism that's emerged in the last few years, and I think that that is actually where there's tremendous public consensus. Even though Me Too has become fractious in many ways, even though there's a lot of controversy, you just don't meet anyone, you know, it really in any part of the political spectrum, you know, from any religious denomination who thinks it's okay for a 22 year old girl to go into her first job and to be exploited for sexual favors. And so I I do hope and think that that is a lasting change. But you started by saying a lot has changed and a lot hasn't. What do you think hasn't changed? What are the what's the next uh, barrier or barriers or um, steps? I'll tell you the most haunting thing that I see. And this is both in stories I've reported on and those I've read. The number of big Me Too stories now that have, I wonder if you've noticed this, that have post-2017 allegations, it's really something. Like I helped a little with the coverage of former New York Governor Andrew Cuomo. And if you look at the timeline, I wrote a story about this. If you look at the timeline of his offenses, it's 2017, it's 2018, his own state is burning up as the cap New York was the capital. I once like drew a map of Manhattan and like you could see where like all of these powerful men, you know, had had fallen. And at the same time, the former governor is racking up new allegations. Or if you look at the Deshaun Watson story, if if some people here are not from the United States, this is a super prominent football player who has had dozens of massage therapists um, come forward with, with really disturbing and similar allegations of him taking advantage of them. And those are relatively recent allegations. So I think a difficult and provocative question is like, who does this in 2022? You know, like what, like really, like we didn't, didn't, didn't society all have, you know, sort of this massive discussion, but obviously it's complete, you know, we can't, I don't think we can blame move powerful movements for the things they don't accomplish. You know, we don't sit around and say, well, you know, the civil rights movement didn't really do away with racism. And so, I think it's what we've always known, which is that this problem is so intractable that it caused women all around the world who had basically nothing in common to to read the Harvey Weinstein stories and the other stories and to say, wait a second, this is a piece of journalism set very far from me, but like, how is it about me in some sense? How are they reporting some of the things that I experienced myself. Right. Well, we'll come back to that, I'm sure. Um, so Kendall, sadly, horrif- horrifyingly, many black men in America have been killed by the police. And uh, so at the time of uh, George Floyd's killing, did you understand or think Did you understand how big this story was or would become and what made it different from some of the other killings that have not gotten this kind of attention? So, um, yeah, in Minneapolis, we unfortunately have had this happen um, numerous times. Um, And 
I think it was maybe five or six years. It was Jamar Clark and then Philando Castile. And um, it was just really interesting to be in the midst of COVID and to have this happen on Memorial Day. And I was working the desk the, um, the next day and I was wondering, I'm like, okay, so who is going to come out uh, for yet again, another black man killed by the police during COVID, who's going to actually risk their lives? Risk? We didn't have the vaccine at the time. Who, who in this community is going to come out for him? And, um, and I was very surprised at the amount of people who came, uh, the diversity in those people who showed up for him uh, for this moment. And I think in that point, um, it sort of, it felt different. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just so remarkable to see uh, that kind of outpouring immediately. Um, and it wasn't anything that, it, you know, I feel like Minneapolis had gone through enough of these that it felt very familiar. And this was not familiar. This was different. Was it um, the video? Was it the nine minutes? Was I mean, there's no it's, it's all those merciful things. filling by police. Right. It's all those things. I mean, you know, Darnella Frazier being able to stay in that space, in that terrible space, and have the video that really shows. And, and like, we have video from the... Uh, the cup foods too. So you really got to see sort of from beginning to end what was happening. And anytime you have a person who is dying that's calling for his mother, changes things. Um, also, we were all at home, right? We didn't have that much going on. So more people around the world, around the country, sat and watched what was happening. And so if you were at home, with your loved ones, worried, of course, about COVID and all the things that have been happening, feeling your mortality, and then witness that man call for his mother. It's a game changer. Right. So it was a huge national story. It uh, fueled the Black Lives Matter movement. It brought out all of these uh, people, most local, but some not local. You in the newsroom were trying to balance uh, what was a local story and a national story at the same time. How um, how did you do that? <laughs> um, that was just by doing the work, right? I mean, I think Jody says it. You should just keep on going, right? Um, uh, we were the only media there for a while. I think uh, first national media showed up. I think on Wednesday. Um, it was just important for us. Um, these are our neighbors. These are our family members, our church members. Um, we needed to make sure that the report that we were giving was holistic in terms of that what that community looks like. We wanted to make sure that it was not two-dimensional, so not cops versus protesters, because we know when we watch protest movements that it is not a monolith inside there. There are different types of people and what it looks like during the day is different than what it looks like at night. And so how do we, over the course of time, really like each day's paper, but online, show that difference between what a peaceful protest looks like, also what looting looks like? Um, what, um, how do we make sure that um, people still are angry, but also have their dignity at the same time, right? Um, so there was a lot of talking through what that meant, um, what that meant to be the local organization where we, you know, when everybody leaves, we are still here. We still have to deal with the trauma that the city has gone through. Um, and we're responsible for giving a report that's full, accurate with life, right? Yeah. And um, at, I guess I would ask the same question I asked Jody. What 
what changes do you feel like this murder and this uh, coverage brought about? And then what did, but. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, is, I was like listening to you going, yes, exactly. <laughs> because it's like, okay, we're gonna put some people in jail, um, but did we solve systemic racism in the police department? No. <laughs> Um, did Minneapolis vote for a strong mayor and not to defund the police? Yes. Um, so there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And, you know, I think that's just the job of news organizations is to continue to do that work to sort of enlighten as, as well as we can. Um, uh, the, I think the change, um, the change happened with us, I think. Um, I think more news organizations have jobs like mine um, that we were able to like look internally at how we were portraying our own communities and what that looks like and how do we need to change? How do we treat each other in the newsroom that also got looked at? Um, I think that gave us enough of a pause to ask how, like what voices are we not hearing? What voices are not in the meetings and not in the room? And how do we better reflect the communities that we're supposed to serve? Um, so if I think that change happened, I feel like there was enough change happening within us, um, within some systems um, that, um, that were willing to do that work. So you said when we spoke earlier that uh, you were the only editor of color in the room That's when correct. a lot of those decisions were being made. Um, do you think that you were heard? Would there be more in the room now? And um, has, has it changed enough? Has it changed enough? No. <laughs> um, but... Uh, yeah, I was the only one. So when, um, you know, the only um, a black person in the room, when we had to decide if we were going to use that frame grab of um, Chauvin kneeling on George Floyd's neck. And so I'm glad to say that, you know, sometimes you just have to raise your hand in the moment, go, like, I do not feel comfortable with this. Can we talk about it? Um, and, you know, I can say that we... Um, have never run that picture in our newspaper ever. Um, but yeah, the, what has changed is like, you know, um, now instead of, I think we had maybe one, one or two uh, managers of color, now there are five. So, um, and there are more people in the room uh, when decisions make, are made. Um, it's it is still tough. Like the the little five of us get together weekly. Actually, I'm missing the meeting today, um, and just really just talk through what the newsroom needs to do to move forward. Um, we also act as a support for each other um, to make sure that um, we're getting sort of the, the self care that we need because it's a it's a job to try and, you know, we've got 250 some people in, in the newsroom and to get all of those people, that big ship moving towards change in a real way um, is an undertaking, but, you know, absolutely worth it. Yeah. So, so I, I, I have other questions. I'm sure you do, Dave, but I'd like to open it up because I imagine, you know, we put a lot out there. And so I imagine there'll be a lot of questions. If not, we'll just yammer on. But oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. So any question? Just kidding. Point this a certain way. Oh, just go ahead. Hi, my name is uh, Jake. I'm a student here and a fellow at the Stabile Center for Investigative Journalism. It's been a joy hearing from all of you. Um, my question, I think a lot of people, I'm in my early 20s, I think a lot of people plus or minus five years of my age who want to do this journalism thing professionally, look at the world and see really intense political division, um, complete poor 
complete authoritarianism in the backslide of democracy that we're seeing right now around the world. Dean Cobb earlier made a really great point about the fact that American journalism in a lot of ways missed the McCarthyism parallels of Donald Trump's election. What can my generation of journalists do to make sure this industry keeps moving in a good direction amid what is one, an intensely changing industry, and secondly, intense an in, industry under intense threat right now? Let's start with Jody and then Kindle, maybe you want to. I think that you and all of us t- together can take on one of the biggest conceptual challenges in investigative journalism, which is that the model that has served all of us so well for a long time is under a lot of duress. Because say like the post, let's call it the post Watergate model of investigative journalism is you work really hard, you find stuff out, you're very scrupulous and fair, you put it in the paper, outrage ensues, some grown up in charge does something about it, right? Change happens, maybe you're lucky enough to win a prize for it and get recognized, and then you move on to the next story. And that, like, I think this is the biggest thing I've thought about in the last couple of years. Of course, that model still works. Look at the coverage that my colleagues did on drone killings this past year. I mean, they 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 held government to account in a way that, you know, was completely inspiring to me and so many other people. However, we're in a situation where like it's actually pretty hard for readers to get outraged. I mean, we the story you're describing, we witnessed a murder. You know, we witnessed a murder together. What could be worse? And um, you know, something we talk about every single day is that readers are coming from a, a pretty call it cynical place, right? I mean, it, especially people your young your age, I think. like kind of believe that every system is already corrupt. So, you know, A, are you going to get the kind of reaction where somebody is going to read the paper and say, oh my God, you know, what can be done? Second of all, we know that government is somewhat paralyzed, not at every level, not in every situation, but there's a kind of stasis that's taken hold in which if you report something really terrible, you know, the assumption that there's going to be a corresponding reaction, I don't think is a solid one, you know, anymore. And, you know, but none of us are willing to give up. Like that's clearly, that's clearly the wrong response. So I think the really interesting conceptual question is, does investigative journalism somehow need to interrupt its own rhythms or innovate to find, do we need to, you know, do we need to play the piano a little differently or play a different instrument in in a way that widens the potential for the truth to have impact? Kendall, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I do actually. Um, a- take the mic. Take the mic. Hello. Um, Yeah, like I really like that idea of a different like staccato for investigative journalism. Like you could, I always believe in the power of the collective and how do we as, you know, journalism orgs get together and maybe it's a different staccato and it's nationwide staccato. Maybe it's, you know, I just think about how, scientists team up together from all across the world to work on a cure or a vaccine. Um, Maybe we need a way to work on a cure for us and our problems and our issues that come up. Um, And how does, what does that look like? Um, Yeah, I just believe that, you know, in the power of many, many voices, many different voices, same time. David, as an editor. Yeah, I I think your frustration is not age contingent. It's, we all share it. In 1987, eight, I forget what it was, the New Yorker published a 40,000 word long piece called The End of Nature by Bill McKibben. And it was all about how, um, thanks to the testimony of James Hansen and others, that 
um, the world was going to overheat if we didn't watch it. And if we continued our habits uh, of transportation and the way we live and let's accept air conditioning on a day like, but, but it, it, the way we live, we were going to kill ourselves and the planet in, a, in, in, in global terms in short order. And life continued, the magazine came out, people, you know, in, you know, in this neighborhood and various other neighborhoods, they read it and they took it on board and it had no effect whatsoever. No effect whatsoever. More immediately, Maggie Haberman and 15 other reporters at the New York Times and at the Washington Post and God willing at other places like the New Yorker have one revelation after another about the perfidy, the lying, the evil, the, the mendacity, the idiocy of the previous president of the United States. And you, you, you would have thought that each and every one of these revelations would be disqualifying, disqualifying. And here we are two years later, he is still shaping one of the two major political parties. So I, I share your frustration. However, what's the alternative to, to give up? You can't give up. You're here. Thank God. And there are a lot of professionals in this room who do extraordinary work, whether they're sitting in, uh, you know, whether they're in Eastern Ukraine or they're uh, working for Ukrainska Pravda or, or they're, 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 they're Le Monde or on television or at the New York Times or in Minneapolis. And thank God for that. However, I think there are many, I, we, it's very common in a newsroom of any kind to call reporting stories, stories. And it sounds infantilizing, like as if they're Good Night Moon uh, or Pat the Bunny or something like that. But they're called that in, in my mind for good reason, because there are all kinds of ways to reach people. Uh, in terms of the way you tell these stories. In fact, we were talking about awards before. We've expanded the Pulitzers to take in audio, which is now um, very much in our way of living, the kind of reporting earworms that be, can, can be very effective in the way they were not even 20 years ago or, or, or more. I think how these stories are told are very uh, important, and their variety is very important. I know at the New York Times newsroom or the Washington Post newsroom, they're constantly beating themselves up about how much point of view can go into a piece, whether or not opinion can sneak into a piece, the vocabulary. It was a big debate all over the place about when you use the word lie or not. Um, those are healthy debates. Those are healthy debates. But stories sooner or later, as they proliferate, whether if they're effectively told, have an effect. And to think otherwise is to give up the ghost. And I'm maybe at 63 and having put in 40 odd years of this as, as the, the activity of my life, and I know my colleagues have too, I, I do think it has an effect. Look at me too. When I was a kid, Susan Brown Miller published a book called Against Our Will. And it was an unlikely thing for me to pick up as a 18 year old boy, but I did and it had a profound effect on me. And then you would read stories from time to time about rape, sexual harassment. You could certainly see it in life. I married a woman who experienced it in the newsroom where she worked for 10 years um, in a profound way. And there were pieces before Jody and Megan's that were of pe people at least as famous as, as, as Jody points out, that you would have thought would have that kind of, I, I, for the life of me, I don't know why Gabe Sherman's reporting, for example, at New York Magazine about Fox News, and he was all by his lonesome pretty much. Um, maybe I get this wrong, but I mean, I, I really admired the reporting he was doing, and it didn't have that. I don't know why things happen the way they do in terms of result? What is the straw that breaks the camel's back? Is it because it's because it's Hollywood or famous actors and actresses? I don't know. But sooner or later, if the reporting is good enough and deep enough and honest enough, and the storytelling, the way it's presented is effective enough, something breaks through. In Ukraine, there have been abuses and war crimes all over the place. For some reason, Bucha, penetrated right you just you don't know it's not predictable uh we have another question over here then we'll come to jelani afterwards and then 
The woman in red. The woman in red. <laughs> Still noir. Hi, uh, my name is Irene Chalupa, and I work with uh, one of the teams that is being honored tonight uh, with the sub fake group from Ukraine. Um, and thank you, all of you. I love reading all of you, and it's, a, it's an honor to be in the same room with you. What do you do when um, the work doesn't get elevated? Right? You mentioned David Walter Duranti. Ukrainians all over the world have been dreaming of having the Pulitzer Prize taken away from him. So do you, has it ever been revoked? And should it perhaps be sometimes revoked? What, you know, and we now know that- <laughs> Marjorie is looking at you, had to bring that up. Oh, sorry, no, but, but what happens when the journalism goes awry? When the person doesn't- um, Do you, do you say the only journalist- Of course, 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 it's, course, it's, course, course yeah. it's not, of course it's not. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But the, you know, this is an important historical story that was told wrong, so. Um, so close. <laughs> I, you want me to answer for Walter Durante? No, no, no. But as a, as a, I think the, the, the if I, without without getting too much into the internal politics, of it, I think that the feeling is if you if you go to that one, um, madness lies ahead. There, are, the, there are many. If w William Faulkner won the Pulitzer Prize for you know what novels he won for. The Reavers and some other piece of Chazerai at the end of his career. <laughs> Pulitzer, boy, this is, it, I hate to say this, it's just a prize. It is a limited, of, it, you're, you're absolutely right to be furious about it. I agree with you completely on the issue. But I think if you go, uh, you know, I would have thought the corrections would have won the year it was up. Yeah. Richard Russo won, perfectly fine novel. But that's going to happen. That's what makes it interesting, outrageous, and hopefully more often than not, ennobling. I think that there are um, countless fabulous works of uh, journalism and literature that never won. And probably there are many more than Durante who judging, uh, if you take them out of their moment in history and judge them now, we would not agree with them. We would find them racist or sexist or repetitive. And I don't think, you know, as, as David said, I don't think we can go down that road. Uh, as many people who want us to withdraw a Pulitzer, there, I got one last week or the week before, a whole petition to give Duke, Duke Ellington the 1965 Pulitzer. Uh, which was granted to no one that year, and he was up for it, but it was judged that year that it was not his be best work because it is work of the year. He got a Lifetime Achievement Pulitzer in 1999. I mean, I just don't think that we can go back and uh, relitigate. And there is, and, a lot and, and there are errors of omission too. You know, in the horrible run up to the Iraq War. There were stories here and there. I believe McClatchy, right, right. Uh, underplayed, overlooked. They were right. They were right. Yeah. And I don't believe they won a Pulitzer Prize. So there's errors of omission as well, the yeah. great historical concept. Uh, Jelani, do you have a mic? Oh, okay. Uh, so it's, it's great to have the conversation about work that has literally changed our lives. Um, but I do wonder, there's a difference from the, when the kind of external praise and how you view the work yourself in retrospect. So I wonder from the perspective of journalists and editors, if there's anything that even, you know, despite a story having tremendous impact, you look at and go, hmm, I wish I had done that a little bit different or something I wish I had done a little bit better. And if so, what? Oh God. You want me to go? Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> I was like, I'm always the one who's like, when the panel's silent, I'll just, I'll, I'll just bite the bullet. Um, yeah. There's always, there's always decisions that you wish you would have made. I mean, a lot of the times when we were dealing with it, it is in the heat of the moment. Um, it is, you know, for 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 my role in the um, in our Pulitzer, you know, I'm in my bedroom. Um, with a TV tray and my computer, uh, sitting at the 
end of my bed um, editing pictures till two o'clock in the morning. Um, did I make all the really good decisions about which pictures should have run? Probably not. Um, I was just really worried about making sure my people got home safe. Um, so, so there's always a little bit of shoulda, woulda, coulda, um, but at some point you have to realize you made the best decision you could at that moment in time and, and be okay with that. Um, uh, there are things that I wish we had either gone to or looked deeper at just so that we'd have a little bit more context too. But yet again, you know, especially for something like breaking news, um, um, safety of our people was the most important thing. And, um, and making sure that, you know, we felt what we had at the moment really did what it needed to do in terms of telling the story and moving it forward. Uh, there was, or did you want to speak? Uh, there was another question back in that area. It was, I think, him, and then Sorry. over there. Thank you. Ansgar Graf from KAS in Singapore. Um, I was very impressed by all of your statements. Um, I would have a lot of questions, but uh, that would be unfair in this room. Therefore, just uh, one question for, for Kindle. Um, if I um, understood you correctly, you were partly uh, satisfied with the outcome of, of the debate about uh, Floyd uh, George and, and uh, the murder of him, and uh, in regard that uh, some policemen at least were sentenced because of this murder. But on the other side, uh, you said uh, uh, you were disappointed uh, that um, uh, in, in in Minneapolis uh, they still voted voted for a strong mayor and not for defunding the police. From from uh, this um, point, would you say it's a it's a task of media uh, to to work for uh, for for setting a new mindset for people, for example, to to vote for defunding police, or is a task uh, of the media just to to discuss about it uh, without giving. Um, and, um, a result uh, or wish wishful result for this. Right. Like, do we, do we sort of have a side? Like, do we say, okay, this is what should happen. So we're going to push this particular agenda. Um, no, we like our job is to educate, um, educate the people so that they can make, uh, the choice that makes the most sense. Um, it's complicated, right? Um, systemic racism is a complicated thing, and especially with the, the police department. And how do you untangle centuries? I mean, it started as, you know, basically as a slave catching unit, it was the police. So how do you untangle its history from um, its present, right? And so, you know, our job as a news organization is to give people information in a way that they can digest it and make quality decisions about it. Um, and so that's what our job is. Like, you know, I think that our police department is still in the exact place it was. I don't think they've really actually learned anything. They've actually killed more people, more black people. Um, so uh, I, we just met with the uh, new commissioner who's been on the job a month. And you know that was my question to him. I was just like, um, you have structural issues with your department. What are you gonna do? I mean, it has to be, you know, you have to do systematic change of behavioral, but like, your police union is um, problematic because they have a lot of power, right? And also your precinct heads. I mean, like that is your hydra. That's your monster that is controlling regardless of who the police chief is. And what are you gonna do? Um, and that's our job is to ask those questions. Um, and then if they have whatever answer they have, then people can evaluate what that is.
This is certainly an ongoing area of debate since Trump. What is the role of the media that is um, used to, um, on the one hand, on the other hand? And do we treat um, points of view uh, or truth and untruth uh, or um, you know, a white view or a view of, a, of people of color? Are they all in the story? You know, this is really a, a factor in all of these stories and in the big political story of, uh, of covering Trump. Or do we have the patience, the temperament in a moment of crisis to listen to other points of view that are not our own, even, even more complicated? Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, I, you, you said that our, our, our role is to educate, but not only. I think there are parts of, of the media where it's a perfectly not only appropriate, but imperative to persuade, which is slightly different, you know, and... I think not all of us are always comfortable um, when faced with contrary arguments. And it, this has been also a matter of big discussion in the last several years because of the nature of the crisis is so profound. That the nature of the crisis is, is we finally live in history. Americans are so used to, this is one thing about 9-11 that was so shattering, that we live in history. War is not, violence is not something that necessarily happens elsewhere. And right now, we are, our democracy is challenged, global democracy is challenged in a way I, I wouldn't have imagined. My entire formative experience as a human being, as a journalist, was be you know, between 1989 and 1991, thinking democracy was on the march, e even, in, even in Moscow, in a, in a, in a kind of rough and, and uh, un unknown way. And now here we are in an absolutely contrary direction, and it's far from the only crisis. So, I, you know, you're, 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 not only your question, but your anxiety, it reflects uh, those of uh, millions and millions of people, well-meaning, and not only who are 20-something years old. I share it. And it's reflected in newsroom conversations and arguments all the time and from our readers and I, like never before. You've had a lot more room to persuade at the New Yorker than these newsrooms have had. And so it's a very intense debate, I think. Yeah, but who am I persuading? This is another source of frustration. I'm the New Yorker. I'm perfectly aware, <laughs> perfectly aware that um, my silo is, is, is not necessarily any wider than, uh, uh, than a lot of others. Right. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. My name is Issa Mansari from the Africa Institute for International Reporting and the Africa paper based in, uh, in Minneapolis. My question is, I've always been interested in the vertical partnership and collaboration of major newspapers and smaller newspapers to create impact journalism. Mostly I see the horizontal partnership and collaboration between major newspapers and major outlets creating that type of partnership and bringing story. How do you open your news media or your news outlet, the New York Times, the Star Tribunal, to smaller news outlets and journalists who are there maybe with a story that we create an impact in collaborating with them or say visit your newsroom and look at your editorial process or when the editorial meetings are going on to understand how it looks like. Thank you. I know a guy you should talk to. <laughs> I know a guy. His name is Dean Bacay, and this is his new job. Um, so Dean was until recently my boss. He was the executive editor of the Times. And, you know, it was really interesting to watch because, you know, from my vantage point, Dean could have done anything after he added at the Times, right? He he is, you know, it's not only my view, but the view of a lot of people that he's the most successful editor of the New York Times in the modern era, maybe ever. And the thing he chose to take on is the project you're talking about. So he's going to be working with young journalists 
at a you know a pretty exciting array of places because there are not only long established news organizations but there are places like Mississippi Today and the Baltimore Banner which are really trying to rebuild uh, local journalism all over the country and he's going to be bringing a lot of investigative firepower and experience uh, to reporting those stories and you know I think we were all we I mean talking about what are the stories that still shock you the story from mississippi about people not having drinkable water i think is still like it's just still a shocker it's yeah. it's a shocker right and and um you know i i when i read that the first thing i thought was oh my god like like the the vision of a dean let loose on a story like that you know is is as as horrible as the story is it's like potentially a glorious thing um to behold so i i think i think you're beginning to see more of that collaboration and i hope we'll see a lot more of it in the future yeah i'd like to add to that there is a panel uh tomorrow on collaborations with uh, Ron Nixon of the AP and um, ICIJ, I think it is, um, Mike Hudson, and, and talking about ongoing collaborations. Um, ProPublica uh, does a lot of collaborations between small and large papers. Uh, Report for America sometimes is a bridge between, you know, putting people in smaller papers so they can do some of this work and teaming up. The Pulitzer Center uh, for Crisis Journalism, I think it's called, which is not related to us, funds a lot of these projects. And uh, th there were actually was a freelance piece funded by them in the New York Times Magazine this last weekend. So, uh, you know, it used to be, um, you know, we were like, don't tell anybody what you're doing and don't team up and y you've got to get it first. And I think with the economic crisis in the industry, everybody started to realize that there's uh, power in numbers and that you want a wider distribution and you want local expertise, whether that's in Afghanistan or um, Minneapolis, and you want the dis distribution of a New York Times or something. So I do think that's a real positive change in the, in the industry. I think we have time for one more question. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. It's such a privilege to hear from you all. Uh, my name is Giuseppe Rajkumar Gurandi. Uh, I'm a journalist a student here from Cape Town, South Africa. Um, I think my question, it has to do with impact, but it's very much around sort of linguistic semantics, I guess, because I'm, I'm a hope for linguistic semantics. Um, but the idea of at least from my generation, that our language matters it has certainly been very sort of found for us, right? And the New York Times has come under fire, for instance, with the pronouns debate, you know? Um, and my pronouns are they, them, for instance, and that's something that would be very important to me if I were a reporter at the New York Times, hint, hint. Um, <laughs> um, but the, the language is, is clearly important, right? And when we, when we report on women, you know, whether what are we talking about, biology or gender expression, the inclusivity of that term, we're having racial discussions, um, how do we draw those racial discussions back to the very humane impact outside of statistics, so on and so forth. Um, and I wonder, when it comes to your reporting, how conscious are you or your institutions that you work for, whether it be in their style guides or in the day-to-day -day conversations you have, how conscious are you constantly of the inclusivity of, of the language that you use, whether it be for trans non-binary folk, whether it be on racial um, lines that takes into consideration ethnicities, takes into consideration my continent, my country, for instance, and the diaspora of black people um, and so forth. How often do those conversations actually happen? All the time. And, uh, you know, during Black Lives Matter, every newsroom that I know of had a capital B, lower B, capital W lower D conversation. And people, and there was, you know, and the, and the reactions to this, particularly um, between and among my, with me, with Black colleagues, ranged from, you know what, I really don't care that much because there are a lot of other important things to people cared intensely. We had that conversation and it changed and it changed. And um, we, use, we use pronouns as you describe them. 
Um, and the world did not shake and fall apart. Um, I, you know, I, it, it, because it was important, particularly to, to the people themselves who are being named, um, it, it instantly became a matter of, uh, uh, of some import and it got resolved. And I, but I work essentially at a small place and decisions can be made kind of quickly because it's, it's not a very uh, big and bureaucratic it, we're not an institution. The New York Times is an institution like, you know, Harvard University, Columbia University or, or the State Department. or so. It's a big institution. And um, I, my guess is decisions like that take a little longer time. But well, the, a, the AP um, yeah. is an institution with a standards desk and it puts out a, a, a standards uh, book every year. So it forces these discussions every year and it becomes a kind of guidebook slash Bible for media around the country and sometimes around the world. So that helps accelerate some of these changes if they do them right, which they generally do. I used to, I was working for AP. <laughs> that said, I think the Washington Post came out with a different answer than the New York Times and the New Yorker. I think capital W prevails at mm, yes. uh, as well as capital D. And not an AP. But they're, they're, however long delayed those conversations were, they did happen and have happened. I love those conversations. I feel like newspapers are meant to be argued with. I really do. I think they're meant to be argued with. Anyone who thinks a newspaper is like the word of God and the omniscient right answer, I think has not either been reading or generating journalism long enough. Uh, we need to wrap this up, but I wanna thank all of you again. First of all, my esteemed colleagues, thank you so much. This was really wonderful. And thank you taking your you know, glorious Friday afternoon to come here. Thank you.